Mount Hagen City back to normal. Bougainville Peace Agreement to continue post-referendum. And New Zealand dairy giant invited to Papua New Guinea. This is the National MTV News with Meriba Tulo. A very good evening. Thank you for joining us. This is Monday's News. The situation in Mount Hagen City has returned to normal after four people were killed last week from a fight between the Engen Enga community and the Jika Mulagam tribe of Western Highlands Province. Provincial Police Commander Chief Inspector Jacob Kamiak commended his men and women for maintaining peace and good order. The fight lasted three days and the suspects have been apprehended. The fight between the Jigas and the Angan stopped after two suspects from the Jiga Malagam tribe surrendered to police last Wednesday. They were each charged with one count of murder. PPC Kamiak said a stone fight broke out between some Angan men, believed to have been drunk, damaged vehicles that were parked at the Gomis Oval during rugby competition. Owners of the vehicles retaliated and ran over two men. Police on duty responded. and stopped a fight that could have been, uh, uh, could have escala escalated into towns and the settlements. The tribesmen of the two Angan men travelled from Lyagam in Anga province to Western Highlands province and retaliated. PPC Kamiak said a man and woman from Tambul Nebilia and Chimbu province were shot by the Angans. Both lived at Kimininga settlement, close to the local Jiga Malagam people. Uh, the master thought that they were against the Jiga sleeping there, but uh, they mistakenly uh, they shot the uh, young woman from uh, Chuawe, Chibu province, and a young man from uh, Tambul. The two suspects were then released on bail, but will appear for the court hearing. PPC Kamiya clarified that the suspects were released to prevent the tension to escalate into the city. He said that Jiga people were angry because the Angans didn't surrender their suspects who allegedly killed the two people. Both parties held a roundtable discussion at Mount Hagen police station last week and came to an agreement to take responsibility of the deaths. Vasinata Yama, National MTV News, Mount Hagen. The autonomous Bougainville government has reiterated that the Bougainville Peace Agreement will continue post-2020. ABG Secretary for Peace Agreement Implementation, James Tannis, made this clarification today following what he termed misconceptions about the duration of the BPA. There had been some misunderstanding over the role of the Bougainville Peace Agreement with some of the view that the BPA would cease to exist following the staging of the referendum on Bougainville scheduled for June 19, 2019. Mr. Tanis has clarified that the referendum is an important activity to assist in bringing lasting peace to Bougainville, but does not mark the end of the agreement. According to Mr. Tanis, Bougainville will continue to operate as an autonomous region under the powers of the BPA, the Bougainville Constitution and the PNG Constitution until the two governments negotiate a final political status for Bougainville based on the result of the referendum. This, he says, is crucial as the BPA is a document founded on permanent peace and is based on the principle of peace by peaceful means. He adds that the BPA will continue to guide both governments because the referendum vote is not the end of pursuing permanent peace for the autonomous region of Bougainville. A new 10 million Kina road was constructed last week in the Nabak area in Nawai district. The road will benefit the locals from two villages who have been facing difficulties accessing government services for over 10 years. The new road will also make it possible for them to transport their produce to Leh. The road construction is funded by Nawai district to a cost of 50,000 Kina. This is the new Gawam Simbu and Jitare road that will benefit more than 5,000 people. The people living here in Simbu and Jitare area walk for more than 10 kilometers to get here at Gawam village to get on a PMV in order to access hospitals and to sell the produce in Leh. They have been facing difficulties accessing services for almost 11 years. Last week, Nawai district funded this new 10 kilometer road to a cost of 50,000 kina for the people to have access to basic government services. Road human resources must come up. 
the Sarajisa role too, but boost him a rural economy. Now, copy all the time, so I come up long year, one one year or so, 600 back. All the long year, it's strong long year. Family one one, heavy, all carim, no sakarim. This is a road, but Ansalim, big play economy, but boost him long year. At the same time, but this is a road too, and by it, it's a road, and by it, it's a road too. Now, why district is one of the nine districts in Moriba province, road is an issue of importance. A former councillor, Yatu Nomayong, says the people have suffered when walking from one village to another to access services. Problem where all all people long 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 place long here long people long long wood eleven now going to long wood fourteen long somewhere uh government somewhere zitare where people long long all people facing them long long road that's all. The local women from the two local level governments also expressed their appreciation during the launching of the new road on the weekend. Mama Karim, now this layout, so me plus I feel big play with street. Some plus situation in the camp, some plus mama, all by hard look Karim now, me plus I had. Me and Mr. Karim, like Blumina, so what about you call on Karim ambulance now? Pining more leader, or bring him all. Transport, they come inside, or transport him all, you go down. Now, me play east, all merely long. What put in earlier, me play Saika, me plus a Karim, big play Bilum. Now, all picking it too, and tap, me plus I tight him boon. Nawai District has completed its five-year development plan that was endorsed by DDA last week. The member for Nawai, Kennedy Wenge, says the road will also connect people and tourism. Come up in Saruga, but come out to the national park, in a preserve area. All kinds of things by come up, by attracting plenty of tourism around this part of the This is the policy of the government for today, agriculture and tourism. So this is a road, road for tourism and agriculture. Julie Badui Owa, National MTV News, Lay. Four airstrips in the Koroba Kopiago district of Hela province will undergo restoration and maintenance from the Rural Airstrip Agency. This was made possible after an MOA was signed between the Koroba Kopiago DDA and the RAA. Local MP and Minister for Immigration and Border Security, Petrus Thomas, said the partnership is timely and will serve those in remote areas of the district. He said an estimate of over 70,000 people in his district will have access to the four airstrips, which will also open up routes for government services to reach the people. Meanwhile, RAA CEO John Bromley said the airstrips will be restored and maintained to civil aviation and safety standards. Work is set to begin in the coming weeks. You're watching National MTV News. Still ahead, an invitation for a New Zealand dairy giant to come to PNG. That and more when we return. Stay tuned. Welcome back to the news. The Papua New Guinea government has invited a multi-billion dollar dairy company to establish itself in the country. National Planning Minister Richard Maru says this is to open up the country's dairy market. The Planning Minister was accompanied by Trade Minister Wera Mori when they visited New Zealand's dairy giant Fonterra in Auckland recently. The visit to Fonterra was part of the four-day engagement in New Zealand by the state team. With Fonterra being a leader in the dairy industry in Australasia, the government believes establishing it in PNG will have a positive impact not only in economic growth but the dairy sector. It's a market that Papua New Guinea wants to tap into with dairy milk in the future. So we see ourselves major opportunity now to replace all dairy imports and huge export opportunities for Papua New Guinea as a company. The dialogue skilled out the risk and opportunities of Fonterra being another major player in PNG's dairy industry. With Fonterra expanding in parts of Asia, the Pacific has not been considered in the past 20 years. Trade and Commerce Minister Wera Mori says with developments in the oil and gas sector, dairy produce will be high in demand. Papua New Guinea to move forward and together with uh, New Zealand as a partnership uh, as development partners. Thank you. Fonterra is a global dairy nutrition company owned by 10,500 cooperatives in New Zealand. Its products are distributed in more than 140 countries around the world. That's more than 23.7 billion litres of milk reaching the seven continents of the earth. The discussions ended with a team from Fonterra planning to visit PNG for a feasibility study. You know, our population is now 8 million, growing at the rate of 3.1 percent and next 20 years our population will double and we've got to look at ways to replace imports and grow our export sector, grow employment. 
Anchor is one of Ontario's leading brands in the world market. Jack Lopave, Junior National MTV News. President of the PNG Poultry Industry Association says if proper biosecurity standards are established, poultry alone can generate up to 450 million kina a year in revenue. Chris Prestwood told MTV the industry, along with other sectors, have not reached their full potential given the poor framework surrounding biosecurity. He says authorities have been pushed to assist the government develop a working system for the country. Value the industry at nearly a billion kina. Mr. Presswood so told MTV I News biosecurity standards of Papua New Guinea needs to be improved. He says poor frameworks have been an obstacle for the poultry industry, which has kept it from developing. The president of the PNG PIA believes all stakeholders can help the government. We have to ensure biosecurity is as strong as we possibly can. That means that all of our flocks are clean and healthy and we can achieve the, the right outcomes for the people of PNG. So it's all about food security. The poultry industry in PNG has struggled in the past 15 years despite producing enough for the domestic market. But there is potential to export and compete in the world market. President Presswood says the recent New Zealand trip has positioned the poultry industry and government on the right path for work to begin. PNG is in the same position where we're currently looking to create a really strong position on biosecurity and that's going to give us some opportunities to ensure food security and future exports down the track. So as we move forward from here, we've got a picture of what we need to do. The New Zealand government under the leadership of Minister Maru has been able to work with us and show us the way that we can, can create that environment for biosecurity and move forward. Upon arrival in Port Mosby, National Planning Minister Richard Maru gave an overview comparing biosecurity standards used in PNG. He says this is one priority area with government shifting its focus away from the non-renewable sector. So biosecurity is a very big issue. And New Zealand is number one in the world. It's an economy underpinned by agriculture on the back of science and on the back of biosecurity. They are very good. A biosecurity forum will be held next week in Lei Morobe province. Jack Lapave Jr. National MTV News. Ten vocational training centres throughout the country have been selected for new infrastructure buildings fully funded by the European Union. This award of contracts is 36 million kina in total, marking another milestone for the partnership between the European Union and the government of PNG. The Department of Education will take the lead in supervising and overseeing the development of these infrastructure. The official signing of contracts for the development of critical infrastructure for 10 selected TVET schools happened today under the European Union funded Human Resources Development Phase 2 project. Under the current program, I'm very pleased that we, this is, I would say, a happy beginning of a new phase of the program. It was not easy to reach this phase. We all know that we face difficulties in the planning and on the design of the infrastructure that we are going to sign today, but we are here. But this is still just the beginning. National Planning and Monitoring Secretary Hakaua Heri, as contracting authority, commended both teams from the European Union and the government of PNG in ensuring that the tendering and contracting processes were duly completed within the given time. So I'm pleased to um, to note as well that uh, apart from this 36 million kina contract that we will sign this morning, we have also signed an 8 million kina contract to four other companies, a private sector company, who will be supplying the necessary tools and equipment uh, for learning at the 10 TVET schools. She also made mention of the TVET teachers' qualification upgrading training last year, which only adds onto this achievement. The qualification upgrading uh, training for 240 TVET teachers from across the country. That is an excellent achievement for us. 
Atlas Steel and Rhodes P&G are the successful bidders for this contract. The Department of Education will take the lead in supervision and overseeing the development of the infrastructure. The 10 TVET schools are chosen right throughout the nation. They are the Morata TVET um, uh, Training College in Badili, this is in NCD, the Raval and the Kabaira ones, that's in East Britain. We have the Bulolo and the Umi Colleges in Morbe. We have the Kamaliki in the um, Eastern Highlands. Uh, the Yawasora in East Sipik, Ligam and the Pompa Boots in Anga. So those are the 10 colleges, Tibet colleges, that we will be centering our assistance on. Lilian Soperakenea, National MTV News. Governor General Sebob Dadai today congratulated PNG's High Commissioner to the United Kingdom, Winnie Kiap, who recently won the 2018 Diplomat of the Year Award. Kiap was nominated by her peers for outstanding service as a diplomat and in her other roles in other organizations based in London. In a statement today, released today, the Grand Chief Sir Bob Dadai spoke highly of High Commissioner Kiap's accomplishment. He says she is a shining example for fellow diplomats and a role model that women in country can look up to and emulate her strength and courage in serving the nation of Papua New Guinea. Over 100 human resource managers and CEOs from the public sector around the country gathered for the HR Managers Forum today in Port Mosby. This forum is centered on the theme, Embracing Impacts of APEC and Digitalization for Improved HR Practices. Public Service Minister Elias Kapavore, in his keynote address, reiterated the importance of managing human resource data and records. Over 100 participants gathered at Gateway Hotel this morning for the Public Sector Human Resources Managers Forum. The participants included CEOs and human resource managers from different provinces. I want the resolutions of this forum to be taken seriously and implemented as a way forward. May our attendance at this forum and the workshop bring positive changes to the way we have been conducting ourselves as HR managers and deliver what is required of us effectively and professionally. With the forum themed on embracing impacts of APEC and digitalization for improved HR practices, participants were challenged to analyze how they were doing in their departments. They were also challenged to see how they could enhance their skills to give improved outcomes. Control, taking ownership of your HR data on a weekly basis. That I think is important. You do not allow allow those to go through and then you continue to ask later on what's happening. However, we have all the records in place and we know exactly which departments have excess staff and we do those who do not have excess staff. So uh, in this particular forum, uh, my team will actually show you all the records and identify which ones are supposed to go, which ones uh, will be uh, catered for back in the system and, and, and so forth. Department of Labor and Industrial Relations Secretary Mary Morola gave an in-depth presentation of human resource management in this era. Her presentation brought out the challenges of HR managers that resonates across all sectors of PNG. We must also address and embrace structural adjustments in human capital development because digital change and digital age is right here with us. This forum is a two-day event with an aim to answer the question, how can digitalization make an impact in HR practices? That the public service holds the key to delivering what we have targeted for or deliverables as we set for ourselves in 2050. So it's so important. Lilian Soperakinea, National MTV News. The Ombudsman Commission will be filing a Supreme Court reference regarding the validity of the recently enacted Public Money Management Regularization Act 2017. The PMMRA, which came into effect on the 9th of April this year, has effectively moved 90% of all government authorities' accounts to the Department of Finance. The decision by the Ombudsman Commission today follows a recent statement after a meeting with both the Departments of Finance and Treasury over the finer aspects of the PMMRA. The Ombudsman Commission, in a statement late this afternoon, announced their decision to file a Supreme Court reference over the validity of the Public Money Management Regularization Act 2017. 
According to Chief Ombudsman Michael Dick, this decision has been reached following its own studies into the Act which have raised serious constitutional issues. These include issues relating to right to ownership of property, constitutional status of constitutional institutions, removal of jurisdictions of the courts, parliamentary control of public finance, harsh and oppressive penalties, protection of the law, and freedom of expression. The Commission has further explained that the decision to file a constitutional reference also follows a public statement it issued on April the 13th, as well as after its meetings with the Departments of Finance and Treasury to get an understanding on the finer aspects of the Act. In announcing their decision, the Ombudsman Commission has also invited interested interveners to contact them to obtain a copy of the reference once it has been filed. Whilst the Commission has announced the decision to refer the PMMR Act to the Supreme Court, the Chief Ombudsman has reiterated that it is not at liberty to discuss further the merits of the case. The Southern Region consultations for the Draft Disability Authority Bill 2018 ended last Friday. The general public gathered to discuss and present their views and contributions in consultation of the draft bill. Department for Community Development and Religion Deputy Secretary Mazan Sliviak was grateful to the participants and satisfied with the Southern Region consultation outcomes. A full-on week of Southern Region consultations for the Draft Disability Bill 2018 ended last week Friday. We had on Wednesday consultation with uh, Disabled Persons Organization and we um, had government officers come and talk to us on the opinion about the draft uh, bill on Thursday and today was for public consultation. So we had a good uh, turnout of representatives who came here to PNG IPA. Very good uh, input has been given into the draft. The Constitutional and Law Reform Commission constructed the legal framework of the draft bill. However, it was open to the general public, service providers, public servants, and persons with disabilities to critique and review. Drafts and advisory legal officer Watson Simeong said they have noted many new additions, one of which is the inclusion of invisible disabilities. We gauge their views and contributions, and the contributions that they have made uh, from Tuesday all the way to today have been captured and uh, it will be compiled in a report form and this consultation uh, report will be submitted together with a draft, refined draft bill which will be uh, presented to the NEC. And the Department of Community Development will now start consultations in other regions. This process will take about a year before the bill is presented in Parliament of the United Nations Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disability through this national legislation. So that will be a very big milestone for Papua New Guinea as we report to UN, as the department is working closely to uh, put together this report with the Office of uh, Human Rights, uh, United Nations Office of Human Rights and support from CLRC and other relevant government agencies like Foreign Affairs and DJEG. We're looking forward to having that report go to uh, the UN Committee on Convention on the uh, Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disability, informing them of what Papua New Guinea is doing. Lilian Sopera Kinea, National MTV News. Divine Word University held its annual open day program yesterday for students to showcase their work. The program attracted the public, business houses, future students, employers and stakeholders. The displays of yesterday's event were centered around this year's theme, Transformation Learning with Core Values for the Digital Age. The Divine Word University Open Day is an annual event. The university invites the public business community, individuals, and potential employers to attend. Four faculties with over 12 departments took this time to display their programs. So we are running a setting for an international airport setting. While it also gives the opportunity to the public and future students to learn more about the programs the university offers.
business houses were also present to market the different products, while schools like Lutheran School of Nursing and New Guinea Binatang were invited to be part of the program. Meanwhile, the program started at 9 a.m. yesterday and ended with the winners of the best faculty displays walking away with 10,000 kina, 8,000 kina, 5,000 kina and 3,000 kina respectively. Masa Louis, National MTV News, Medang. This is National MTV News. We go for a break now, but when we come back, some stories making headlines overseas. Stay tuned. Welcome back to Monday's news. Turning overseas now, geologists say 10 volcanoes have opened up in the residential area of Hawaii, pushing out lava and toxic gas. At least 26 houses have been destroyed, leaving families without homes. For people who live in the areas affected by these fissures in Leilani Estates, many of them were able to get back in to retrieve anything they weren't able to evacuate with the first go round. But still, officials do not want them to stay there. They're saying these fissures continue to open and they don't know when these fissures are going to stop opening. They don't know when the Kilauea eruption will finish. So they want people to get out of there, not just because of the lava that is bubbling up out of the earth and shooting up into the sky some 60 to 100 feet based on what some residents have told us. They don't want people to stay there also because of the toxic gases. You're talking about sulfur dioxide that is also very dangerous. So that's why they've widened the perimeter around where these fissures are opening. I want to show you where I'm standing right now. This is a lava flow from 2014. And as you can see, it came down and cascaded around threatening some buildings right here nearby. There's no way to stop a lava flow when it's coming down. Hot, molten lava. So you just have to let it go. And that is the danger here for the people who have built their homes in these communities. If uh, lava comes in and takes the homes like it has done to several homes at this point, they may never be able to go back to their neighborhoods. And for many of them, that is the most devastating news. Now we turn to some geological turmoil that actually got people excited. Scientists in New Zealand are clamouring to get a look at a new giant sinkhole. A few days ago, this was pristine pasture. But this huge crack is what Colin Tremaine discovered early Monday morning after the region was hit by record-breaking rainfall. The only thing I've ever seen close to it was in the Kokoda crates with the famous cow that was on the split, which we were contemplating how we're going to rig that one on one further up. The sinkhole runs along a fault line on this Tumunui farm, and it's revealed thousands of years of Rotorua's volcanic past. What I see in the bottom of the hole is the original 60,000-year-old volcanic deposit that came out of this crater. The walls are made of stacks of sediment 10 to 12 metres deep from lakes formed in the crater. The grey layers are nearly three metres of ash from volcanic eruptions, including Tarawera, Haruharu and Taupo. And while sinkholes in this area are common, it's the sheer scale that has scientists excited. It's about 200 metres long, 20 metres wide and 20 metres deep, the equivalent of four Olympic swimming pools. This is pretty spectacular. It's a lot bigger than the ones I've normally seen. The turmoil would have started as a small crack underground, spreading out as rainwater seeped in. This is an erosion process. It's been going on geologically for a long time. It's related to high intensity rainfalls. Um, it's not a new process that's been happening for a long time and we can expect it to happen again in the future. Meanwhile, it's back to business for this farm. The first job, fencing off this new feature. Another horrific sexual attack in India is sparking outrage as protesters demand a justice. A teenage girl in a rural village was allegedly gang raped last Thursday. Then the girl was burnt to death in her own home after her family sought justice from a local village council. Earlier we spoke with CNN's Nicole Kumar from New Delhi. The family um, alleges that on Thursday evening when they were attending a wedding, the girl, uh, the 16-year-old, was kidnapped, uh, brutally gang-raped. And on Friday, the family then approaches the local village council in this village, as you said, in the northeastern state of Jharkhand, uh, one of the poorest parts of the country. The village itself is in a remote, uh, a remote section of the state, quite far away from the nearest urban center. They approach their village council seeking justice, as you said. These village councils don't have legal authorities. They tend to be made up of local elders. 
Uh, but in these distant parts of the country, they can sometimes wield enormous influence. So the family goes to them demanding justice, uh, narrating what happened the night before. The village council imposes punishment on these men, but, but listen to what it is. They, they impose a fine of 50,000 rupees, that's about $750, and they ask the men to do 100 sit-ups, that's it. Then the case takes another very disturbing turn. The men, the accused men, in retribution, in a chilling retribution for the family going to the village council to report this, attack the family. They attack the family home, they burn the house down, the girl is inside, and the family says that that's when she died. She was burned to death. The case is now with the local police. They've arrested more than a dozen men, including the head of the village council, and the body has been sent for an autopsy um, as, as we wait, and we're waiting for more details to see how the investigation unfolds. But it has, again, these very horrific details have once again turned the spotlight on the problem of sexual violence in this country. One year ago, Emmanuel Macron became the youngest president in French history, a centrist who promised to liberalize the labor market and revitalize the country's economy. But 12 months later, Mr. Macron faces stiff opposition from the left and angry labor unions, which could prove to be the toughest challenge of all. It was to Beethoven's Ode to Joy that Emmanuel Macron completed his march to power. In less than a year, he'd founded a new party and seen off the old ones. Now he'd won the presidency and could take his vision to the world stage. He began with Vladimir Putin receiving him grandly at Versailles, but speaking plainly alongside the Russian president of human rights abuses and allegations of meddling in foreign elections, including his own. Politicians have the responsibility to make decisions, to say things, and when press organs spread infamous counter-truths, they're no longer journalists, they're organs of influence. With Donald Trump, the exchanges would be warmer, but the strategy the same. The building, whether in Paris or in Washington, of a solid relationship, combined with tough talk and plain speaking. I do not share the fascination for new strong powers, the abandonment of freedom, and the illusion of nationalism. Emmanuel Macron has been determined to represent and forcefully the world view based on common values and multilateralism that used to be fashionable in London and in Washington. And domestically, he's been equally determined to liberalize France. Last autumn, he saw off protests to reform France's labor code, among other things, giving companies more flexibility to hire and fire. Now he's in the middle of a battle with rail unions and, despite strikes, protests and popular discontent, he says he won't back down. There are those in France who remain skeptical of the spin, accusing Macron of being more style than substance, and those on the left, who worry about the liberalizing of the economy and the direction in which Emmanuel Macron's march is taking them. Back home now when cocoa farmers in the hinterlands of East Britain province continue their daily struggle to reach cocoa markets to sell their produce. Farmers are complaining they are making losses even when cocoa is selling at a good price. Most of their money they make is lost to freight costs. This used to be the new Masawa plantation, located in the hinterlands of Lansul binding local level government. During its glory days, it used to assist local farmers here by buying their cocoa beans, processed it and sent them to Kokopo and Babal town in preparation for export. In the early 1990s, the plantation wound down most of its operations. Cocoa farmers who once benefited from this infrastructure were left to find their own way to the nearest cocoa market in Kokopo and Robao to sell their cocoa bags. To get to New Masawa, it takes about three hours on a four-wheel drive vehicle or about an hour by boat. Most of the cocoa farmers here prefer to go by boat as it is the shortest route into town. A one-way boat fare costs about 50 kina per passenger, but if they have to go with their cocoa bags, it is an extra spending. Lawrence Sisam is one of more than a hundred cocoa farmers here who is continuously feeling the pinch of bringing his produce to the market. Um, transport, and by you find him at boat or dinghy. 
digging boat ya, boleh pain. Sampai lah time yang bayu kan wait one week tu. Oh, sebab time nunggu time bayu stop pun pasti. Na, lo free belum boat em, fifty kena lawan lambek sebab sila kari lo boat. Although Coco is making a gradual comeback from the Coco Port Borough infestation, transportation still remained a big problem for them. Na time. Uh, all plantation has um, um, broke down, all run down. All work in, in, in put down some plant, uh, all bulldog in Bagarap, rot in Bagarap. We play the same time straight, like this uh, time come and tap. By me play walking cacao and tap, or one of kind, me play walking one kind of work, or some peanut, or little copra, me play walking. By me play uh, carry this law, something go down. M, rot me play bear him go down, M, M two hours. Coco is widely grown in East New Britain province, generating a steady income for every household all year around. In the last old binding area alone, more than 200 families owned at least two hectares of cocoa blocks. New economic reports have indicated that cocoa is picking up after the CPB incursion. A cocoa bag is currently selling between 300 and 400 kina. Meanwhile, agricultural-based organizations are making inroads into the rural areas, encouraging farmers to remain loyal to their coca blocks. But although this provides some ends of solution, it doesn't solve their problems completely. Edwin Fidelis, National MTV News, Kokopo. This is Monday's News. Trukai Sports is coming up next. Stay tuned for the details. Tukai Sports. Welcome to Tukai Sports. We begin with Taekwondo. Stones Taekwondo will be conducting their Taekwondo and martial arts training in the East Pacific Province. The training will be held from the 7th to the 9th of June. It is likely to be conducted at the Sipic for Hope Hall located within Wewak Town. The four-day program will begin from 9 a.m. each day. NCD Governor Paul Spakop says support from the government is a start of many good opportunities for rugby in PNG. He said this after stating that while the government spent 5 million kina on rugby league, PNG's participation in the Rugby League World Cup did not showcase much of the country's culture and tradition and the city was not asked to participate in any way. But he says it is time to put that aside and focus on rugby, a sport that has the involvement of 150 countries and 6,000 registered players, making PNG part of a global rugby community. Last World Cup we spent uh, 5 million on the World Rugby League uh, World Cup. So I'm not going to criticize them, but I just want to, you know, I explain why we want to start this partnership with you all. Yeah. And when the World Cup came, uh, we had no opportunity to go down there to promote the city and promote our culture, our country, our way of life, you know, the possibilities that are here in Port Mosby to go to the global community. In the opening, we were not invited. And in the closing, I was not invited. The PNG Palace, I really believe that uh, they can shine and fly and lift our game and our country, our city to the highest level. Winning out there 7 9 15, I am asking. Rugby League, you may get Dayata, so me by come now, somebody you play with Rugby Union. To Aussie rules now, the South Pacific Under 16 AFL team began the tournament on a good note, defeating Queensland 51 points to 36. Despite their brave efforts in their second match against Brisbane North, the South Pacific lads were outclassed with the final scoreline Brisbane North 73, South Pacific 16. In today's final playoff against Brisbane South, South Pacific came back strong to defeat Brisbane South by 42 points. Rex Peragua was voted South Pacific Player of the Carnival. Overall, the South Pacific team gave everything they had to come away with a much-deserved victory to finish third in the competition. A program to help mentor and build national-level performance coaches will be rolled out in the coming months. Coach candidates will be selected through a strict analysis and interview <laughs> procedure. PNG High Performance held a workshop for all national federations officials and executive representatives to brief them on the new national mentorship and scholarship program. 
At this stage, the program will be restricted to Port Moresby-based national coaches. This is because they will be working closely with high-performance headquarters in Port Moresby. The program will also require regular hours during the week for capacity training programs and supervision monitoring. During the rollout of the program, evaluation and reports with requirements will be done for coaches to meet. Before a national coach can go through the program, there will be different requirements needed in order for them to be eligible. Coaches with serious misconduct records, inappropriate behavior and poor ethics will not be able to be considered for the role. Elijah Levet, National MTV Sports. Don't go away, we'll have more of Trukai Sports after these messages. Stay tuned. Trukai Sports. Welcome back to Trukai Sports to the NRL now and the New Zealand Warriors' big win over the West Tigers may have come at a heavy cost with Isaac Luke, Sean Johnson and Adam Blair all failing to finish the match because of injuries. Welcome return to form for the Warriors, but coach Stephen Kearney's been left to count the casualty list. And now Johnson looks like he's really battling here. Yeah, Sean, sure, sure, you'll, you'll need to get some, uh, get some pictures of it. Johnson had scans today to see how bad the ankle injury is. In 2018, the playmaker just can't seem to catch a break after sitting out the last fortnight with a groin injury. We, we need him in our footy team. He's a, he's a classy player. Uh, he brings so much quality to our team. Isaac Luke's been just as unlucky. The latest setback, a dislocated shoulder. He's not quite doing cartwheels, but he's trying to convince me that he's fine. As for Adam Blair, well, it takes a lot to keep him off the field. I could put my house on that he'll, he'll play next week. Why not put your house on David Fusitua finding the try line? Once again, the flying winger showed why he's the NRL's leading try scorer, crossing 11 times in nine games. Just brilliant! That's not how you'd describe Ivan Cleary's West Tigers. Yeah, it's, it wasn't that night tonight. The visitors reduced to 12 men on two separate occasions, and the Warriors made them pay. Unfortunately for Tigers fans, there was more misery to come. Carl Lawton grabbing a double on his club debut. I think uh, I'd take it as a fluke. <laughs> I'm not a try scorer machine by far, <laughs> not at all. There's no fluking the Warriors' results. With seven wins, they've now equaled their entire tally from last season. And finally to Netball in New Zealand. Defending champion Southern Steel have carried on where they left off last season as the NZ Netball Premiership got underway. Despite losing key players Janelle Fowler-Reed and Jane Watson in the off-season, the Steel got off to a flyer against the Mystics. Oh, lovely sighting of Tapia Selby Rickett on the baseline. Finished nicely. Final score was 55-47. In the later game, Silver Ferns captain Katrina Grant was back in action for the first time since the disappointment of the Commonwealth Games. She was prominent throughout, including even a Harrison Hoist, as the Pulse beat the Magic 45-33. And that's it for Trukai Sports. Up next, the weather details for the next 24 hours. Trukai Sports. Trukai Sports. The weather details were proudly brought to you by Dulux. Celebrating 50 years in PNG and the only paint made in PNG. A look at the weather forecast for the next 24 hours in the Highlands region, Mount Hagen, Goroka, Kundiawa, Mendi and Wabeg. All these major centres can expect some showers over the next 24 hours with morning fog. The details were proudly brought to you by Dulux. Celebrating 50 years in PNG and the only paint made in PNG. And that's a new sport and weather for today, Monday the 7th of May 2018. On behalf of the entire MTV News team, pleasant viewing for the rest of the evening. Good night. <laughs>